The first speaker, Miguel Nicolelis, comes from Brazil via Duke University in the United States, where he's a professor. His research focuses on neuroprosthetic devices, brain plasticity, and neuronal coding. Please welcome Professor Miguel Nicolelis. Welcome, Miguel. Uh, I have been interested for the last 30 years on trying to understand how the brain generates reality, how it generates everything that defines human nature. We talk about brainstorms everywhere, but in our lab we see and hear these brainstorms every day. And here is a sample of about 10 seconds of 100 brain cells firing these electrical brainstorms and coding for a behavior. Well, about uh, 14 years ago, my colleague John Chapin and I decided that we needed a new paradigm to try to understand these brainstorms. We needed to measure quantitatively this electrical activity and try to see if we could extract meaningful information from a subset of neurons that we could record simultaneously. At that time, we could record 100. So we created this paradigm and named it brain-machine interfaces. And basically, in this paradigm, if you have a brain you are uh, using some sensors, some electrodes that I'm going to introduce to you very briefly to record the extracellular electrical signals that these neurons are producing, these neurons that form circuits and networks in the brain. And what you're trying to do is to see if, if under the reaction time of your animal, if you can read these signals and extract from them the kind of motor information that will be required for the body to move. But in this uh, particular paradigm, what you want to do is you want to see if you can move a robot or a virtual body or some other construct or artifact using the raw brain activity without necessarily engaging the body. And since these devices can send feedback information to the brain closing this closed control loop, you actually can study how the brain reacts to these movements, how the brain interacts with these actuators once it gets the idea that it can actually move these devices without engaging the body into contracting any muscle whatsoever. So that's the principle of the brain-machine interface. I'm going to show you a few key experiments uh, that establish this field as a reality, and I hope to introduce to you what is coming to the future with one example of an international pro project that I hope in the next few months will allow us to have a real categorical demonstration that this paradigm is not only useful for uh, basic neuroscience research, but it can also be a watershed for uh, rehabilitation medicine, neurorehabilitation medicine. But first, let me start with the past. Let me start with the first uh, clear demonstration in monkeys that this thing could work. Uh, this is our favorite monkey, Aurora. And about 10 years ago, she learned to use the, you know, these joysticks to play a simple game of putting this cursor inside the target. But while she was doing that, we were recording 100 cells of her motor cortex and trying to extract the kinematic information that her brain was producing ahead of the movement in order to see if we could translate this information to digital commands that a robotic device could understand. And the question at that time was, could we actually make Aurora control a robotic arm and hand without engaging her body, just by using her thinking alone, her brainstorm activity? So this is what happens the first time we actually tried that. Uh, this was a, a long winter night in North Carolina, and we basically took the joystick away from Aurora. We turned on this connection between her brain to a robotic arm, and we let Aurora figure out that she now, to get the reward that she wanted by putting the cursor in, inside the, the target, she didn't need to move her body. Being a clever monkey, Aurora just relaxed, it stopped moving her arm, as you can see, but as you can also see, she continued to move this cursor to put it inside this target, just by thinking. Because we were able to extract from 100 cells enough information to get a seven degree of freedom robotic arm to actually do the job that Aurora's body was doing before. She was imagining these trajectories and the brain machine interface was making this robotic device that you can see here, actually do the job that Aurora needed to get the, the juice. 
the Brazilian orange juice, you know, the most expensive item of our experimental paradigm. But as you can see here, Aurora, 30 days later, not only can move this robotic arm just by thinking, but she realized that she has not lost the ability to control her own biological arms. So by all purposes and means, by using this brain-machine interface, Aurora acquired a new arm and now could take advantage of three arms, one robotic and one biological. These days, in about 10 years, we move from 100 neurons to close to 2,000 neurons recorded simultaneously. This is the latest coming from our laboratory. You can sample from up to 10 cortical or subcortical structures simultaneously. And we are, uh, here you see an implant from the top of the head of the monkey. And we are just preparing ourselves for a 10,000 micro eye implant in the next couple of months. Because the technology now has allowed us not only to put that many electrodes in the brain without causing any major damage, but it's all wireless now. We can do that through a, a multiple thousand channel wireless device. In fact, if you feed forward to the present time from Aurora's time, you can see now Cherry, her cousin, playing the same game using now 500 neurons, broadcasting activity to a wireless interface. And you can see that she's doing it very quickly, very fast, very precisely. And more than that, Cherry learned that she doesn't need to play this game just with a cursor. She can use something more interesting, like an electric wheelchair. She can drive a wheelchair in our lab just by thinking, just by creating brain patterns that she's conditioned to use. In fact, these are virtual bodies that monkeys learn to control now in our lab just by thinking. They basically assume the first person's perspective of these avatars in virtual space. We just demonstrated in this study that above 500 neurons, or in the vicinity of that, monkeys can actually use now both arms simultaneously. And one of the first interesting things that we notice is that when you go from one arm to both arms moving at the same time, that transform is not linear. It's not what we expected. By summing the right hemisphere with the left hemisphere, we get by manual behavior. It's non-linear, but it can be described by a quadratic function. We are lucky. We got a nonlinear behavior that could be reproduced by a computational model. And these animals now can do that under the window of 300 milliseconds. So they don't move their bodies. They control a virtual reality body. And they can do a lot of interesting things, as I'm going to show you in a second. Well, when you look inside of the brain of these animals, as they are doing this transition from using a real actuator like a joystick to controlling something with their minds, Several findings, you know, blow, blew our minds. In three minutes after the animal engages in moving this actuator, you can see that the neurons down here don't remain quiet. They, if they remain quiet, this graph would be all blue. What you see is that these neurons acquire new properties that are related to the robotic arm and not anymore to the body alone. So these neurons are mapping the movements of this robotic device and are incorporating this device as if it were an extension of the body representation that exists in this part of the brain called the motor cortex. So at that point, uh, I suggested this hypothesis that our sense of self is not limited just to the surface of our body. But as, as we interact with tools in our environments, we are basically enlarging this representation to incorporate the tools that we use to interact with the world. Like a tennis player, that one hits the ball, a professional good tennis player, he's not hitting that ball with an extraneous artificial tool. He's hitting that ball with an extension of itself, of himself or herself. Likewise, a piano player, when he's playing the piano, is playing and is engaging that tool, is assimilating that tool as an expansion of his or her sense of self. Well, since we now knew that our monkeys could work with these avatars, we created, a, uh, together with our colleagues at the EPFL, Hannes Bloer and our uh, joint student, Suleiman Shakur, uh, an avatar of a monkey, the, uh, the arms of a monkey. We've projected this in front of our animals, and we occluded the view of the actual arms of these animals with a little platform and put a little robot here that could touch the arm of the animal at the same time as these little spheres could touch the avatar arm. 
We did the same thing that Jonathan did. After three minutes of doing this synchronous stimulation, we stopped stimulating the real body of the animal, but continued to stimulate the avatar arm that was present in front of the animal. And what we noticed in both the somatosensory cortex and in the motor cortex is that in the first condition, when we are touching both the virtual and the real physical arm, neurons respond very beautifully to this touch of the body, and that's what you expect because you're touching real flesh. However, what we did not expect is that when we stop stimulating the real body but continue to stimulate only the avatar, 35% of these neurons continue to respond. The responses were highly significant, they're smaller, and they have very long latencies. Instead of 35 milliseconds here, they had a 100 millisecond latency for the response, suggesting that these were very likely mediated by the visual system. So we continue to study this phenomenon, but now we're using a brain-machine interface in which the feedback of the actuator is not delivered through vision, as you just saw, or tact tactile stimulation of the body, but instead projects this feedback from the actuator directly into the somatosensory cortex via microstimulation, because our microwires can be used both for recording and microstimulation at the same time. So we deliver waves of microstimulation to the S1 cortex to provide tactile feedback. And we ask the question, can this animal, in a closed loop control, both use its brain activity to move this robotic arm at this virtual arm, avatar arm that we created, but also use the feedback provided by microstimulation to detect the texture, the microtexture of objects that this animal touches with this avatar arm in virtual space. So we put this animal in the environment and we created objects that are visually identical, but each one of them had a microtexture that could only be detected if you rubber your virtual arm and you identify of your S1 cortex the type of frequency, spatial frequency of this object that is being translated into temporal frequency of microstimulation, the S1 cortex. There was only one object that was moving a position that gave you the right uh, uh, answer. And if you grab that object, you actually got a reward. And our monkeys actually perform very well in this task. What you see here is a little video clip showing that the monkeys can use their brains to move a virtual arm to explore the texture of the three different objects. And when he finds the correct object, and the legends are only for you, we don't leave the legends for the monkeys even because they cannot read English, as you know. Uh, when they find the correct object, they have to press the center of the object based on the texture that they identify. But now, the texture is being identified by direct microstimulation of S1 cortex, bypassing the entire body. So there is no interference of the body here, either to move the arm or to identify and process the tactile feedback. This is just to show that what I'm talking about, a phenomenon known as cortical plasticity, can be a stretch very far. For instance, if you get an adult rat and you implant on the head of this animal a simple infrared detector, and you now translate these uh, infrared signals into electrical signals to the somewhat sensory cortex of the rat, the part of the brain that processes information from the face, the whiskers of the rat, we actually can get an animal to learn to touch light, not to see infrared, because mammals cannot see infrared light. They don't have a photoreceptor for it. But they can actually track light and get a reward for tracking light just by feeling infrared light through microstimulation of the infra, uh, somosensory cortex. And that's exactly what happened here. And as you can see, the animal is almost tracking the beam of light by feeling that as some sort of tactile information with no other manipulation. Well, over the years, we expanded this brain-machine interface concept not only to upper limbs, but also to lower limbs. And I don't have much time now to demonstrate the whole experiment, but we got monkeys to use their brain activity uh, at Duke to control in real time the movements of a robot in Kyoto. So we closed this loop with visual feedback and got these animals, even though they stop moving in these treadmills to get a robotic uh, 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 humanoid robot in Japan to actually move. 
and it was basically sending visual feedback to the monkey so that the monkey could see and was being rewarded by each correct step. The monkey could see the progress of this processing in real time. So when this idea, uh, we published this idea, it became clear to us that the brain machine interface that was created just by a basic science purpose could now be the basis of a new potential rehabilitation tool that we call cortical neuroprosthetic device. Because if you had a patient with a spinal cord injury, our idea was we would be able to bypass this injury by extracting the motor information from the brain storms that we record in these brains, send them to computational models that can extract the information needed for a new body, a robotic exoskeleton to be controlled and perform the functions that the body can no longer perform because signals can no longer reach the muscles because of the spinal cord lesion. So we create a distributed um, asset basis to try to put this idea into practice. And we are lucky enough, a couple years ago, to actually uh, meet the president of Brazil. And when we presented this, this initiative to her, and since at that moment Brazil had just been awarded two major international competitions, the World Cup and the Olympics, uh, the president was looking for a, a great way to portray a different country that Brazil is trying to build based on education and science. And basically she accepted the idea of trying to do a demonstration of this technology in the opening ceremony of the Football World Cup uh, next year on June 12, 2014 in Brazil. For that, we start actually building this robotic exoskeleton and this exo can be controlled by any type of brain derived signals from the least invasive like EEG all the way to the type of signal that I was mentioning to you, single unit recordings uh, recorded with multi-electrodes implanted chronically in the brain. Whatever the patient can give to us can be used to control uh, this device. The foot, the ankles, the, uh, the joints, and key locations in the exo have these elements that have pressure, temperature, and velocity accelerators uh, detector that can actually provide tactile and proprioceptive feedback to the subject via a vest, a shirt, that Hans Blur has developed at the EPFL that is basically a haptic display that uses the chest and the back to display information about walking and joints uh, flexing and extending. Combining all of this, basically we intend to fulfill this, this demonstration, to basically provide the world with a vision that is now possible, really. We don't need to wait for a long-term future. We can actually start developing neuroprosthetic devices that can recover and restore mobility right now. You just need a little bit of what we heard this morning, collaboration across multiple fields that can come together, engineers, computer scientists, neuroscientists, rehabilitation professionals, and get this going. So what we hope you, you guys will be able to see on June 12, 5 p.m. Brazilian Standard Time, 2014 is represented by this little simulation here that Suleiman Shakur from the EPFL has created for us and is a young adult using a non-invasive EEG based signal controlling the exoskeleton that you just saw is standing up in the side of the pitch for the first game walking all the way to the center of the pitch with the Brazilian team and the other team that is going to lose the game next door getting to the end, midfield, and kicking the ball to show that the meaning of a Brazilian kick will be changed forever. Thank you.